share with us in a uh, informative presentation uh, regarding uh, Asperger's disorder and uh, high functioning autism. We have with us uh, two very erstwhile uh, researchers and uh, lovely people as well and I will be bringing up the rear so that's my job, so don't worry about me. But um, no, um, I would also like to say we are going to create a magical feat right before your very eyes. We have an hour and a half in which to present information regarding diagnosis, research, and treatment regarding high-functioning autism and Asperger. Um, and we're going to do it in an hour and a half. Now, mind you, you can go pick up all at least a hundred books, and each of which would probably take 20, 30 hours just to read, yet we're going to do it in an hour and a half, and we will. Um, obviously, we won't do that. But what we will try to do is to present something that makes some sense and helps to give you information that will guide you in trying to make good decisions involving uh, individuals that you know or work with who are either diagnosed with Asperger's or high-functioning autism. Tonight, our first speaker will be Dr. Sally Ozanoff, who is a full professor in the Department of Psychiatry and one of the senior researchers here at the Mind Institute, and who has also co-authored a book on Asperger's syndrome, especially for parents. So without further ado, Dr. Ozanoff. Thanks, John. Um, real pleasure to be here, and thanks for everyone disrupting your dinner hour for this. Um, so I am going to start the presentations um, by talking, providing some background that I think will help with the presentations following me, um, just about the diagnostic process and about what are the differences and the similarities between Asperger's and high-functioning autism, how do we diagnose it, how do you know if you got the right diagnosis, things like that, that often come up once we start talking about research and treatment. So I'm going to lay the foundation there. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say is um, that we know very, very clearly, particularly for Asperger's and high-functioning autism, that there's a big delay between when parents first become concerned about their child's development and when the ultimate diagnosis um, of an autism spectrum disorder gets made. Um, there are quite a few studies now, probably over a dozen, suggesting that um, most children on the autism spectrum are displaying symptoms by roughly 
between 12 and 18 months of age, and that the average age of first concern of parents is 18 months of age. Um, so roughly half of parents being concerned even before 18 months of age. Yet, the diagnosis of autism um, takes place in the fourth year of life, so at three, three and a half, a um, little bit older than that in certain studies. And the diagnosis of PDD-NOS, or what sometimes we call autism spectrum disorder, um, takes place closer to even age four, and the diagnosis of Asperger syndrome takes place around age seven at, on the average. So there's this very big lag, and we know we can do a lot better at um, early identification than we're currently doing. Now that said, um, how do we do this? The first thing that I want to point out is that Asperger syndrome is sort of a new condition. Um, it hadn't even been ever described or had a name for it until the 40s, same time, in fact, that autism was first described. Um, and I'm going to read to you the most famous case of Asperger syndrome described by Hans Asperger himself. He was a pediatrician in Vienna in the 1940s. And so he wrote in this famous case study, Fritz was a highly unusual boy who shows a severe impairment in social integration. When somebody was talking to him, he darted short peripheral looks and glanced at both people and objects fleetingly. Normal speech melody was missing. His speech was often sing-song. Only rarely was what he said an answer to a question. Occasionally, he stereotypically repeated the question, a meaningless word, or perhaps a word he made up. He never got on with other children. It was impossible to get him to join in group play, but neither could he properly play by himself. He just did not know what to do with toys he was given. From early on, he had shown an interest in numbers and calculations. Even before any systematic teaching had begun, he had mastered fractions. So this is an example of a child who was described in the 40s with classic symptoms of an autism spectrum disorder. Now, because um, this was first written in German, and it wasn't translated into English in, until the 1980s, um, this account, really, of the higher functioning end of the spectrum wasn't um, read by the broader um, Western and English-speaking medical literature. Um, and so we weren't really aware of children like this. But simultaneously, Kanner had described autism. And he said clearly, and, and actually used many of these same descriptors to talk about autism. Um, and he described some cases who were like children with Asperger syndrome right in his initial description. So individuals who could talk and who had normal intelligence and things like that. And so from the very outset, there have been questions about how are Asperger syndrome and high-functioning autism related. Let me say quickly that I use the term high-functioning autism, and it's usually used by most people, to indicate children who meet criteria for autism, but who have um, intelligence in the average range, and usually have, at least at the current time, um, pretty fluent language. So they speak appropriately, they can use grammatically correct sentences, they can talk in full paragraphs and things like that, um, and have normal intelligence, but also meet criteria for autism. So the questions that were raised, once especially Asperger's account was translated into English, were how these two were related. So one um, possibility is that they're really pretty different disorders um, that are two separate categories, that they have some qualitative differences. And what I mean by that is that there would be certain things that you would see in one condition that you would not see in the other condition. So there'd be things that would separate the two um, that make them quite distinct. And then the other option being that they're really on a continuum. They're only quantitatively different. And so that is they differ in the number of symptoms or in how severe those symptoms are, but they're all the same symptoms. So you can't really make a qualitative difference between the two. Their profiles are similar. It's just that one might have slightly higher profile than the other. And so that question has been um, around in our literature now for 25 years or more. And I think we might know the answer, which I'll get to. So let me tell you first how we diagnose it in um, what's sort of our diagnostic Bible, which is our DSM-4. Any of you who have children who've been diagnosed, you've probably gotten what's called a DSM-4 diagnosis. So this is just the most current version of our diagnostic manual. And what it does is it lays out 
specific criteria that individuals have to meet to um, have to be considered that they have any particular diagnosis. And it does lay out criteria for both autism and for Asperger's syndrome. And I'm just gonna walk you through this so you can see how similar they are. Um, so first of all, the number of symptoms, there's a list of 12, and it says that to have autism, you need to display at least six of those symptoms. Um, and they have to be in a certain pattern. So at least two of the six symptoms have to be in the social domain, things like relating to other people, friendships, um, empathy, et cetera. At least one of the symptoms has to be a communication problem, so difficulty with conversation or echolalia or other unusual aspects of speech. Um, and then one of the symptoms has to be in the repetitive or stereotype domain, so unusual interests that are highly focused or repetitive movements or things like that, unusual use of objects. And then the other symptoms to add up to six can come from any of the categories. But what you see is that it ha you have to have at least two social and you have to have symptoms in all three areas. Now, for Asperger's syndrome, it doesn't actually say how many symptoms you have, but for reasons I'm going to get to in a moment, um, you basically have to have less than six, because these two diagnoses are mutually exclusive. So you have, if you have over six, then you're going to meet criteria for autism, usually. So usually kids with Asperger's have fewer symptoms, but they have to have this, a similar pattern. They need to have at least two social and at least one repetitive behavior symptom. In the communication domain, one of the big dip excuse me, differences between these two disorders is that no communication symptoms are required. So you don't have to have any oddities of communication, but they're not prohibited either. So certainly many children with Asperger's syndrome will show some of those symptoms. Um, then in the intellectual range, to have high functioning autism, like I said, you have to have average intelligence, and same is true also for Asperger's syndrome. Um, in terms of language development, for high-functioning autism, your current language needs to be fluent, as I defined just a moment ago, same for Asperger's. And then there's this one additional criterion that the onset of speech was not delayed, so that the child is meant to have spoken in single words by age two, by the second birthday, and to be speaking in phrases um, by age three. And additionally, it says in, in the text associated with the DSM that children with Asperger's are not, you know, usually don't have speech therapy early on or have other speech kinds of problems. So in addition to um, the onset of their words. So in other words, no delay in language at any time, not only currently, but ever. So children with Asperger's are, are the kind of kids who the parents are not worried about their language. They might be worried about other things, but they're not saying, like most parents of children with autism, gee, I wonder why he isn't talking yet, or something seems a little off with his communication or his language. He's very slow to, to learn speech. That would not be um, something that could be in the history of a child with Asperger's syndrome. And then exclusions, there aren't any relevant ones for autism to bring up here, but there's a very major exclusion for Asperger's, and that's that they cannot have met the criteria for autism. And that's because we want to have reliably distinguishable diagnoses um, so that a child could not show up at at a clinic and be seen by you know, two different clinicians, and one clinician call it one thing and the other clinician call it something else. So in other words, they could meet criteria for either one. We don't want that, and so the dsm 4 sets up a variety of rules to make diagnoses mutually exclusive. Um, and so in this case, what you're supposed to do um, when you're looking at a child who is suspected of having an autism spectrum disorder, the clinician is supposed to do, um, is you're supposed to look at the autism criteria and see if they're met. So you go through all of these. And if they are met, you literally close the book and that's it because by definition, if the child meets criteria for autism, they can't have Asperger's syndrome. So you wouldn't even consider it. You wouldn't even go through the criteria and see if they have, um, if they meet those as well, because they couldn't, basically. So that's an important point um, that we call it um, the precedence rule. Autism takes precedence in the diagnostic process over Asperger's. All right, so that, that's stated. This means that we have rules that we can now separate children into these two categories. We know how to 
see, you know, apply those rules and see who has Asperger's and who has high functioning autism. So now the question is, does that matter? Um, we could say, for example, that we could subtype people on the basis of their eye color. Um, but does that matter? Do we know that blue eyes and brown eyes are correlated with anything that's really important functionally. Um, it's not. So in other words, there are times when you can very reliably distinguish things, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the next question is, now that we know how to define these two groups, are they different? And in learning disabilities, this is somebody by the name of Jack Fletcher at the University of Houston who writes a lot about learning disabilities. Um, he sort of set up a series of questions that need to be asked to determine if two subtypes are different of, say, any, any kind of a disorder. Um, and they could meet any of the four or five, how many criteria do I have here? Four, four criteria. Um, not, they don't have to meet all. But two subtypes would clearly be different if they had different causes. They would clearly be different if they had different outcomes. So over time, one turned out to have sort of one trajectory and the other to have a different trajectory. Um, they could be considered different if they needed different treatments or if you use the same treatment with them that they responded differently to those treatments. And then finally, um, they could be considered different if they had different profiles on testing. You know, like when you would go to a psychologist and be tested, that there's a whole variety of things you can look at, their memory, their motor functioning, their language abilities, their spatial abilities, um, et cetera. And that if there was a really different profile in one group than the other, that would also be evidence they're different. So what do we know? We actually have a lot of research on all of these things. First, are there different causes? Um, well, it turns out that there's now been many, 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 many cases, as well as very large studies, showing that um, high-functioning autism, or even autism period, and Asperger's syndrome can run in the same families. Um, so that it's possible for um, siblings to both be affected with an autism spectrum disorder, but one to have autism, the other to have Asperger's syndrome. That's even possible for identical twins, interestingly. Um, second piece of evidence is that the studies that have looked at brains of children on the high functioning end of the spectrum, Asperger's versus autism, um, have found that they have similar neuroanatomy, that there aren't any major differences to say, you know, children with Asperger's, their brain is bigger in this area or smaller in that area or shows a different pattern um, of functioning on neuroimaging. Different outcomes, so how about that? Do we have any evidence that they look different over time? Well, um, several studies now, and I've just cited three, but there's really more than this, um, have showed the children who meet criteria for autism but who develop language um, have a very similar outcome to children with Asperger's syndrome. Um, and then several other studies have showed that it's almost impossible to tell them apart by school age and adulthood. So in other words, you can tell them apart in preschool because that's when the criteria are relevant to, you know, are they talking at two, are they um, using sentences at three, but once they've gotten older, so five, eight, ten years older, they're hard to tell apart. How about different treatments? Well, so far there hasn't been a single study that has um, compared using the same treatment with children with autism and children with Asperger's syndrome to see if they're more effective with one versus the other. So we can't definitively answer this, but yet, in practice, we use the exact same treatments. In fact, um, children with Asperger's syndrome would be nowhere if not for the history of developing treatments for autism for 40 years before Asperger's made it into the DSM. Um, and so we use basically treatments known to work for children with autism for Asperger's syndrome. And so there's reason to believe, although it hasn't been empirically studied, that really there are no differences in treatment needs. And then finally, um, are there different cognitive profiles? And this, again, I could have cited probably 50 studies, but I only put a few up in the more recent ones. Um, but there have been multiple studies that are not finding profile differences in uh, the areas that I've mentioned here. So in spatial abilities, like putting together puzzles, reading maps, um, seeing how things fit together, match in memory, motor skills, executive function, things like organization and planning and flexibility, um, theory of mind, which is taking other people's perspectives. Um, and in virtually 
every study done of those skills, there are no differences between autism and Asperger's syndrome. The one area that there is consistently a difference is that the language ability, particularly of younger children with Asperger's syndrome, is better than the language of children with high-functioning autism. But that's not really surprising given how we define the condition. Um, we said that you have to have normal language development to have Asperger's syndrome no such requirement for autism, so it's not surprising they would differ in that one dimension. So I used to be a firm believer that there were differences between the two. In fact, I've written papers that have titles that say things like evidence of an empirical distinction between Asperger's and autism. But I became, I sort of became, um, started on the path to where I am now of believing that they're really very similar when I joined um, a large social skills group and the people running it defied me to tell who in the group had autism and who had Asperger's syndrome. And so I spent the whole year trying to figure that out and realized that the only way I could do it was by interviewing the parents to find out when the children talked. And so that was pretty compelling to me. And I'm gonna play something, this is not that same social skills group, but this is another one that I ran in um, another state before coming here. And roughly half the children in the group have Asperger's and the other half have high functioning autism. I'm just gonna play a short clip um, and it'll just make the point, I think, that it's really difficult to tell and that they share a lot of features um, and it's not real obvious who has what. Um, and this is a social skills group where they are um, working on identifying emotions and how you would feel in a certain situation and how strongly you might feel that. So that's what the exercise is they're doing. That's always fun. So you can see they're having a great time in there. Um, but like I was defied once by Gary Mezebov, I would defy you to figure out who had which. And frankly, I have no idea anymore, although I sometimes think I might know, but usually you're, I'm wrong. Okay, so there's a lot of consensus now, and I would say that this is not 100%, but maybe like bordering on 90% of professionals, um, or I should say researchers, agreeing that Asperger's and high-functioning autism really are more similar than different. Um, in fact, many people find that if you take children who have clinical diagnoses of Asperger's done out in the community and you sort of do a research diagnosis using very strict DSM-4 criteria that most children with Asperger's actually meet criteria for autism. Um, and in fact, all four of Asperger's original cases met criteria for autism. It's just that they were unaware of each other's um, descriptions at the time. Um, so that, that description of Fritz, if you ticked through the symptoms, you could see he had more than six symptoms. So that alone would mean he would meet criteria for autism. Um, now, there are some big issues related to this. If we know the same treatments are needed, and if we live in regions where Asperger's syndrome doesn't get the same services as autism, I think it's a big, um, it has major political policy implications um, for the fact that there's these two names for things that are very similar. So I'm just gonna wrap up with a couple of slides here to talk about how do we make the diagnosis. I've talked about how we sort of researchers do it, but how is it done out in the community? People often ask me who's qualified to diagnose it. Um, first of all, I think that there's a broad range of professionals who can do that. Um, physicians, so like psychiatrists, neurologists, and pediatricians can, um, psychologists who are um, trained clinically, clinical psychologists and other licensed professionals can, social workers can. But the main point is whoever the professional is, they should have adequate training and experience in having seen children on the spectrum so that you know you're getting a good diagnosis. Um, the main components of the diagnosis are taking a developmental history, so obviously that's really critical to differentiating these two conditions. Um, and also to figuring out if they really are on the spectrum versus have something else entirely. And then also um, actually an observation or an interaction with the child. I say that tongue in cheek, but there's been a long history of people making diagnoses just based on talking to parents and never even seeing the child or seeing them very, very briefly. 
Um, additional testing can be helpful, but there are no medical tests that will diagnose this. They might be helpful in understanding etiologies or other things, but nothing that can tell you, yes, this is a child on the spectrum or not. Um, and cognitive testing and adaptive testing is very important for figuring out what a child's um, prognosis might be and for treatment planning. I probably don't have time to go into this very much, but one of the big questions is, for many parents, is it definitely on the spectrum or could it be something else? And I've listed a bunch of things that um, children often come in with as their first diagnosis. Sometimes it's really right and that is what they have. Other times it was a misdiagnosis and they actually are on the autism spectrum. And other times they actually have both. So all of these things sort of run together, um, can co-occur, but sometimes it's only one or the other. And I think that the simplest way um, to really tell you how we determine that um, is just that we go back to our diagnostic criteria, that they really do work and they're very reliable. In fact, autism is the most reliable diagnosis in the DSM-4. Um, so the fact of the matter is that children who have OCD, children who have maybe hyperactivity and impulsivity, children who have speech problems, children who are depressed or anxious, they don't have the classic history of a child on the spectrum. They don't have an early history of um, communication abnormalities, of empathy problems, of lack of interest or diminished interest in peers, of um, echolalia or other unusual language, all of those, um, or of highly focused circumscribed interests, all of those are features of an autism spectrum disorder. If they're present, they have an autism spectrum disorder. And then what you need to do is figure out, do they have anything, anything else in addition? Now sometimes parents, um, in fact, often parents will um, encounter different professionals who give different labels, and that is going to happen a lot um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, not everybody uses the DSM-4 um, religiously, and so there's some differences in how people interpret the criteria such that a child by one person's diagnosis might meet criteria for one thing, and by another person's standards meet criteria for another thing. Um, and that's not to be worried about. I tell parents that is going to probably happen to you. Don't be concerned about it, especially since we, I'm telling you that they're much more alike than they are different. Consider them synonyms and proceed. You know, if there are conferences or books or talks about the other condition than what your child was most recently diagnosed with, so what? Everything in it will be relevant to you. You should attend, you should read it, you should look at that internet site. What really matters is that you have confidence that the professional seeing your child knows enough about autism spectrum disorders that they got it right about whether the child's on the spectrum or not. Um, so they did a good observation of your child or interaction. They asked you the correct questions. Um, and they really got a sense of whether a child is on the spectrum or not. It's not important necessarily if they have Asperger's versus high-functioning autism. And then most importantly, really, do they tell you treatments that you think are going to fit for your child? Did they hear who your child is? Did they get who your child is? And are they tailoring treatments appropriately? And I'm pretty sure that was my last slide. All right. So we, I think, decided that we would hold questions till the end. We'll do all the questions as a panel together. So I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Marjorie Solomon, one of my colleagues here at the MIND Institute. She's an assistant professor in psychiatry and um, is going to be talking about re current research findings in high-functioning autism and Asperger's. Well, thank you very much for having me here. And thank you, Sally, for the nice introduction. Um, I am going to talk to you about current research on high-functioning autism spectrum disorders. Um, and uh, I'm especially excited to be here because I've recently returned from a wonderful conference in San Francisco called Cognitive Neuroscience Society. And so I'm fresh, full of new findings. Um, so if the talk is a little complicated, um, I would actually ask you if I say things you don't understand to raise your hand and I will try to explain. Um, when I started in this field, I was really struck by the fact that um, research in the field was like the search for the Holy Grail. And what I've given you here is a table out of a paper written by uh, Young Crochet and Crochet in 97 about all the possible explanations for autism. 
you can see there's 15 of them. Um, and they range from adjusting spatial attention distribution, theory of mind, orienting and shifting attention, limbic system functioning. Um, and here are all the many researchers that they credited with uh, coming up with these kinds of explanations. But as you can see, it's been a very complicated endeavor since the beginning. Um, and one of the things they commented was that all of these folks were looking at different parts of the elephant, and they weren't really coming up with an integrated explanation of the disorder. Um, another general comment I'd like to make before I sort of take you on a whirlwind tour of research is that um, we're in some very exciting times, I believe, and um, this is why I believe this. When we study autism, we're really looking at etiology, things like genes and the environment, how they affect brain development, how neuropsychology are the kinds of measures that Sally was talking about that that clinician might use to assess your child, are going to explain behavior, what the picture of autism looks like. And you can see this little Golden Gate Bridge because neuropsychology, in a way, is like our current um, way of bridging between what's going on in the brain and what's going on in behavior. Now, if you look out here, you'll see that in this whole etiology area of genes and the environment, we're having amazing advances now. There are great advances in developmental neurobiology going on, such that people are really starting to begin to understand what's going on at the level of individual cells in the, neurals, um, in, in the brain when, when development is occurring. And we actually now have a wonderful new professor, Steve Nochter, here, who's particularly expert in this area. Um, genetics. There's been an explosion in the type of technologies available in genetics to really understand what's going on um, in the human genome and a lot of efforts to actually sequence the genome. It's done. Um, even in the area of toxicology, um, we have wonderful uh, experts here at The Mind who are studying what pesticides and, you know, environmental pollutants may be doing to interact here at this level. At the level of the brain, we're making rapid strides in functional neuroimaging and also electrophysiology. And here in neuropsychology, because we know more, we can put, have people lay in brain scanners while they do different tasks, we're really beginning to develop a more refined sense of what our neuropsychology tasks are measuring. So finally out here, when we get to the whole level of explaining behavior, there are advances that are going on in how we observe. There's even advances in how we present stimuli to individuals. There's a lot of talk now of the use of virtual reality uh, technology, both as an experimental stimulus, um, because you can uh, have very highly controlled experiments, and as a treatment, actually. Um, there are amazing advances going on in the whole area of social neuroscience. So people are taking social psychology, and through by having these, these um, methods um, open to them, they're really able for the first time to see, well, when people are doing a paradigm to see whether they trust each other, what's really going on in the brains of these individuals when they're thinking about whether they trust someone else. Um, there have been a lot of efforts to study development, um, also using some of these methods. Um, so now we're developing clearer ideas of what normal development is, because we have all these new technologies. Um, and we're getting better at develop, um, comparing across different disorders. So Sally spoke about the comorbidities with ADHD and those other disorders, but we're getting to the point where we can really compare. Um, so you can see there's just really a lot of cause for excitement. So tonight, the areas I really want to hire, um, highlight, I took that list and I boiled it down and I grouped it better. And I want to talk some about cognition. I'm going to talk about uh, something we refer to as cognitive control. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this whole area of autism and ADHD, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about learning in autism spectrum disorders. Then I'm going to switch over to um, the social area, and I'm going to talk some about social processes, uh, theory of mind and some of the developments that are going on in that area. Um, because we now have a little bit better idea of what's going on in the brain, some thoughts about um, neuro, uh, neurobiology and how that affects the way individuals with autism experience themselves, a little bit about mirror neurons, 
And I'm going to finish with gender differences, another area that really hasn't been studied that well. Um, just to let you know, I'm going to try to highlight research programs that are going on here at the Mind and tell you about people who are involved in each of these kinds of endeavors. Um, and I'm a little more expert in this than I am in this. So cognition. Um, when I came to the Mind some years ago, uh, I learned right off from Sally that um, executive function deficits were pretty much the most consistently reported deficits in autism spectrum disorders. Now, how many of you know what executive functions deficits are? Okay, executive functions deficits are deficits in the ability to engage in goal-directed behavior, to recognize plans, to stay organized, to stay on track, to inhibit that urge to go get a pizza when you ought to be doing homework, to hear, um, hear feedback and know how to actually um, adjust your behavior accordingly. Um, and we knew that autism really involved, thanks largely to Sally's work and others, um, impairments in this ability. But we also knew that that kind of ability was impaired in a lot of different disorders, and we didn't really know where in the brain that disorder resided. Um, and, you know, could think that if maybe it's a little different in ADHD, maybe it's a little bit in OCD, if they both exhibit the same kinds of disorders. So in um, cognitive neuroscience, there's a concept called cognitive control. And a nice thing about cognitive control is that a lot of people have tried to figure out where in the brain cognitive control lies. And cognitive control basically means the ability to maintain a goal in your head, online, and let it influence your behavior. Um, and so we know now that there are certain parts of the brain that are really involved in cognitive control. And the thing I like about cognitive control is that it gives us sort of a theoretical roadmap for studying um, executive functions deficits. And that's going to help us to explain some of these um, confusions in the literature that come about because we really don't know exactly what's going on in the brain. And it's also going to give us new tools for looking at brain behavior relationships. So if you can't maintain a goal online, does that have anything to do with why you might have a restricted and repetitive behavior? You know, why you might be fascinated by numbers or trains or the like. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that we did. It was a study of uh, 30 individuals with autism, 30 with typical development. They were 12, and they were very high functioning. Um, they did a task that we call a task of cognitive control. Um, what they did is they would get a, they'd attend for a little while, then they'd get this little green box. And when they saw a green box, they knew that the next, to the next cue, they were going to push a button on a keyboard that was to the same side that an arrow pointed to. And most of the trials were green. But a couple of times, there was a harder red trial. And on a red trial, um, you would push to the opposite side that the arrow pointed to. So it was actually harder. It involved overcoming a prepotent response in two ways. First of all, here, because you had so many more of these, you just kind of wanted to keep going, press, 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 press. Um, but here you had to press to the other side. So you had to both stop this idea of press, press, pressing, and then you also had to push a button to the other side. Um, and we found that indeed, individuals with autism, they were pretty good at those really common green trials, but they were a whole lot worse at the red trials. We also found that individuals with typical development who were less than uh, 12 years of age did a lot worse than kids that were over 12 years of age. So with development, they got better at doing that. Whereas with our individuals with autism, there was actually even a little bit of an increase. So overall, we found that there was an, uh, there was an issue with cognitive control, and there was a developmental issue with cognitive control in people with autism. So they didn't really get better over time in that same age range. We don't know whether it was just a delay or whether it's kind of um, behavior that's you know, never going to get any better because we didn't study older people. So then we decided to take that task into our brain scanner. And here we have 22 individuals with autism and 23 with typical development. They're a little bit older um, and because it's really hard for people to lay in a scanner and not move. And you really can't move if you're going to be in one of these experiments. And they're all very, very high functioning. You know, they have IQs around 110. Um, and we were interested in, in looking at a couple things. We knew we had a hypothesis that two areas of the brain might really be um, involved in this inability um, in cognitive control. There's a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. And we know that the anterior cingulate cortex detects when there's, when there's conflict. So when you see a red trial after you've been seeing green trial 
just for a long time, that's conflict. And some people believe that once that happens, that this region of the brain signals the prefrontal cortex to pay more attention, so to allocate control. And then that's going to impact your performance. So we took a look at those folks, and we wanted to see this is the prefrontal cortex, that area that when we were studying EFs was really pretty much the only area we could even think might be involved. And we looked at individuals in the autism group, and here they are in the middle of doing that task where they're holding that cue online. And you can see to the red trials, they really don't activate any more than to the green trials, whereas the individuals with typical development do. So there's more brain activity going on when we're telling you, OK, you have to maintain. It's a red trial now, and you've got to maintain your attention. And then we looked at um, the anterior cingulate cortex. And this has been a really active area of literature. And um, we found, somewhat to our surprise, that there really weren't great differences during the second phase of the task when we'd think there'd be a lot of conflict. And that both groups activated pretty much the same to both the red and the green trials. Finally, we also looked in the parietal cortex, which is another area that we knew is sometimes influenced by this, um, sometimes shows differences in this task. And here we found that um, the autism group actually activated more to the red, but that the typical group really activated this area of the brain. And this area of the brain is like here, and it's involved in spatial processing, processing of spatial information, or possibly the retrieval of rules. So we found that individuals with typical development were activating more there. Just to show you this kind of all another way, this is that first group. This is our typical subjects. And this is when they are seeing um, the red minus green contrast. So this is more when you're seeing those harder red trials. And you can see that the whole, a lot of areas in the brain really light up. Um, you have this area back here, which is involved in seeing something, the visual areas. You have the parietal areas. And you have some frontal areas here. Now look at our individuals with autism. They activate a whole lot less. They're activating a little bit in the posterior cingulate and some other areas, but they're not activating in those same areas. And when you look at what we call a between-group difference, we find that there are significant between-group differences in a frontal region, which is a little bit more anterior than what we predicted. It's um, Broadman's Area 10. That's this little finding over here. Um, and we also found that in that area that's really good with spatial relationships and rules, we found more activation as well. Um, so that's kind of a way that you can start to tease apart some of the things that we learn behaviorally using imaging. Um, and I'm going to skip over these. This is really um, information, a little bit more information, but I think I'm running late. So a second area that I think is really important in research um, builds on what Sally was talking about with respect to autism and ADHD. Um, that's a diagnosis you're going to hear a lot um, before you might hear an autism diagnosis. And a lot of people have been wondering about that. Um, some people think that the comorbidity, that is the two conditions occurring together, is you know, over 50%, maybe even 60%, I think, in this, this recent study. Um, so there's questions about, you know, as Sally said, there's no way in the current DSM can you diagnose both in the same person. You really can't because of those precedence rules. Um, we also think this is important because there's a phenomenon called diagnostic substitution. A person named Shattuck wrote about this, and it, apparently um, there's been a flip-flop in the amount of diagnoses in schools um, from ADHD to autism, and people are beginning to wonder, well, is it because it's more of a diagnosis de jour? And we just don't really understand that. Um, which kind of raises the question of whether, if we know so many people with autism have attention problems, should um, these deficits be viewed as maybe a core part of the disorder, or are they really a comorbidity? And that's really an open question. Another, I believe, related question is that problems with attention are actually found across a lot of disorders. And what I was saying before about how the explosion of looking at developmental psychopathology as opposed to just looking at autism or just looking at ADHD, you know, as we look at Fragile X syndrome and as we look at um, 22Q11 deletion syndrome, lots of these different neurodevelopmental disorders, a lot of them involve problems with attention. So here are some results from another group of mind investigators, Blythe Corbett, Sally was involved in this, as was Bob Hendren. 
And this is a study that took a look at individuals with ADHD, individuals with autism without diagnosis of ADHD, and then if you could diagnose individuals with both autism and ADHD, there was a group of those folks as well, and typically developing individuals. And this is a test, it's a really hideous, as psychologists we like to trick children sometimes, and we tell them they're going to play computer games when they come to see us. This is one of the most hideous computer games you can ever be forced to play. You have to listen for about 30, 20, 30 minutes to tones and numbers and switch back and forth between the two of them. So here's the auditory quotient. This is the switching, the uh, ability of these individuals to switch properly. And you can see that these, great, these little circles, typically developing people, did a, kids did a pretty good job of this. Um, ADHD folks did the worst. But look at the folks with autism and autism with ADHD. They're kind of right there in the middle. So you can see that's, you know, that's pretty important overlap. Um, here's another. That was in, in sustaining your attention. This is in preventing yourself from making false, false alarms, so pressing the button at the wrong time. And again, you see the same kind of pattern where you have your typically developing individuals who didn't get very high scores on this Connors inventory of ADHD doing pretty well. Where our ADHD subjects, the ADHD subjects are way out here with the individuals with autism in the middle. So I think that's another area you should watch for. Um, a third area in cognition that I believe is particularly important is reward-based learning. And the reason I think this is important is really twofold. First of all, if you think about a lot of the interventions that are designed for our individuals with autism, they're really based on very uh, strong stimulus response um, forms of learning, um, applied behavior analysis, for instance. Um, and a lot of people have talked about autism involving social motivation impairments, but we really don't know a lot about non-social impairments. And while individuals with autism can learn based on ABA, they don't generalize. And that's a well-known deficit in autism, the inability to generalize. So we've started to look in adults, um, and these are some preliminary results we just presented at that conference in, in um, San Francisco. Um, we had 11 adults with autism and 11, 16 typically developing adults, and none of our subjects are on medication. And actually, we really are looking for adults who are not taking medications who have autism um, to participate in this study, as well as typically developing adults. So I'll be here. You can get my card at the end. And if you would like to participate or know someone who does, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, these are relatively young adults, 23 and 24, and they're really bright adults. Um, and we gave them a learning task. And on this learning task, they had to um, do two things, two learning tasks, actually. Here we have these Japanese characters called hiragana. And in this first pair here, which is the 80-20 pair, they had to learn that this was rewarded and this was not. Although it wasn't perfect. You won't, this was the right one, but you only got rewarded in 80% of the time. This one was really hard. It's the 70-30 pair. This is the right one, but it's only rewarded 70% of the time. This down here is almost a random pair, so there's really no way to get this one right. And what we wanted to do was to see if over different trials of training, individuals with autism and typical development could learn these associations and could learn the associations. And we wanted to examine the feedback they received, the right feedback and the, so to speak, wrong feedback. Um, the next thing we did was a transitive inference task. And this is another kind of learning where we trained the individuals on to know that this was always right. The A was always right when it was seen with this stimuli. But when this stimuli was seen with this stimuli, then this one was right, and, and so forth. It's a hierarchy. So you learn that some stimuli have higher values than others. Um, and when you go to test people, you test them with novel pairs. So you test them with pairs they haven't seen before, and you test them to see if they've learned that implicitly, without even realizing it, that this stimulus is, say, better than that stimulus, because they've never seen it before. But they've seen that this one always, tr always wins, and this one loses. Um, so the first test, which is the probabilistic selection task, where they were trained on those stimuli that were sometimes right and sometimes wrong, um, and this is the most commonly reinforced <coughs> stimulus that's reinforced 80% of the time, and this is during training, individuals with autism were really pretty good at figuring out that relatively easy pair. Um, when they got to the harder pair, 
they were significantly impaired. That's the one that was only reinforced correctly 70% of the time. And when they got to this pair out here, they actually did a little bit better than the typically developing subjects, but the, the difference wasn't significant. This is over the first two blocks. So this is right away when they're training. And we were interested in what was going on here that they were learning less well. And what we found was there's a significant difference here that um, when they got feedback that they were right, they were more likely than the typically developing subjects to switch away from that feedback. So we think there may be an inability to use positive feedback, actually, based on that result. When we got to the test, we saw another interesting thing that um, we're still not sure exactly what it means. But look at our individuals with autism who are the blue bars. On that easier association, they did better than the typically developing individuals. Um, we're not sure that this isn't just driven by some bad performance by some typically developing individuals, because no one's seen this pattern before. But it makes us think, you know, maybe it has some face validity. Individuals with autism can learn kind of easy things really well. Maybe it's that they don't move on and learn the harder things when they get really good at the easy things. So again, very preliminary. Um, here's that transitive inference task. And I didn't say that when you have those hierarchies set up, it's been shown in animals that pigeons, and I think every animal except sea lions can learn those hierarchies. So it's a very natural thing to learn those hierarchies. It's actually, most people think it's, it's due to a particular area of your brain called the hippocampus. And what we found here is kind of interesting because in the, we know individuals with autism can't generalize. This BD pair is the pair of generalization. But um, they're really impaired here on um, learning the associations at the beginning and the end of the hierarchy, which are very easy for folks. Um, and we think that what that suggests is that maybe that hippocampal learning is intact, but again, sort of echoing those other findings that the stimulus response learning is a little bit off. So like I said before, failure to generalize learning is core deficit. Most of our therapies are based on learning, but we don't have a great nuanced view of how individuals with, learning, um, with autism learn. So this will be really helpful for therapies. Um, potentially could help us explain restricted and repetitive behaviors that rely on sort of, re that are caused or that manifest as rigidity. And it may offer insights into social motivation as well. So now I'm going to take a very fast tour of social deficits. Um, theory of mind. How many of you know what theory of mind is? Okay. Theory of mind was one of the early famous explanations of autism. Um, and basically what it suggested was that individuals with autism, autism is the result of an inability to understand the contents of another person's mind. So you just don't understand that your thoughts are your own thoughts and another person would have another set of thoughts. And you can see how that would really impair your ability to be empathic. It would really impair your ability to figure out other people in any kind of social context. Um, Frith and Happe, I think, really put it nicely when they said high-functioning persons with autism spectrum disorders possess a late-acquired explicit theory of mind, which is the result of effort for learning. So it's not that individuals with autism, with high-functioning autism, never learn these things. It's just that we all, in the moment, figure things out so fast. We can figure out what other people are thinking so we can adjust our behavior accordingly. If I say something, I see you nodding off, I'll talk faster, you know, because I know those kinds of things. But that individuals with autism, they don't know that. Um, although perhaps you don't think I have a good theory of mind. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, uh, okay. Anyway, social affective neuroscience, that field that I told you about, is really, this has been a hard thing to study because as you can see, it's kind of hard to operationalize and get your arms around. Um, but what we're finding is that people are now really looking in the brain and seeing that theory of mind and empathy have different signatures in a neural way. So that theory of mind, that thinking about what you're thinking about, but not necessarily being empathic, can kind of be split apart. And that this kind of theory of mind is a result of, um, maybe is more uh, a function of the frontal lobes of the brain, whereas empathy is more a result of some of the emotion-centered parts of the brain. Um, and I heard a very interesting uh, talk this weekend um, by this woman, Tanya Singer. Uh, and she's, she's just done a study. You know, we used to think that all individuals with autism had impaired theory of mind, but if you've ever looked at the data, ooh, it's messy. And you think there must be groups in here. And what she actually showed is that it's not so much having autism. Now, this construct, alexithymia, is something we can measure. It means really not being able to feel feelings. So she gave individuals with autism 
and with a lexithymia questionnaire that said, do you not understand feelings? And if individuals with autism also had high scores on this, and not all of them did, then um, they had empathy problems. They had lower activation in those brain regions that are thought to be involved in that emotional feeling of empathy. However, they didn't have those more cognitive theory of mind problems of being able to think more clear-headedly about what you're doing as opposed to feeling it, or, or what another person's doing. Um, and so other people are, are thinking that way as well. Um, and this, uh, this fellow Christian Kaisers, who had a really similar kind of an, an explanation, he's really big into the visceral experience of emotion and is showing that several regions of the brain are really involved in the visceral experience of emotion. Those are something called the anterior cingulate and the insula. And there's been a big, a big theory, actually was written up in Scientific American, about mirror neurons. And one of our researchers here, Sally Rogers, is doing a bunch of work. And Susan Rivera and Cliff Sarin are doing a lot of work with, with mirror neurons. Now, have any of you heard about mirror neuron theory? OK, see some hands. Uh, mirror neuron theory basically uh, suggests that individuals before, they found it actually studying monkeys, that when they put electrodes in monkeys' brains and they watched monkeys, um, they had monkeys reach for objects and then they had monkeys um, uh, reach for objects themselves and then watch other monkeys reaching for objects. And they got the same kind of firing in same parts of the brain. So they came up with this notion that sometimes in order to be able to do something, you actually have to experience it in a very personal way. So if you see something happening in an action, your brain actually starts to fire the same way it's going to start to fire when you do the action yourself. And this really mapped nicely onto some of the imitation deficits that we'd seen in autism before. And it kind of offered a neural explanation for that. So um, a woman named Morella De Preto and her colleagues down at UCLA did a study that got a lot of attention a bunch of years ago. In 2006, they found that children with autism viewed facial expressions and they actually didn't activate areas involved in producing their own facial expressions. So they had individuals look at other kids making smiles, sad faces, etc., and then doing them themselves. And they scanned them while they were doing that. And they found that there was less activation in those brain regions, the insula, and other brain regions that were thought to be involved in mirroring. So hot off the press, another finding, though, is this group actually found that individuals with autism activated those regions more during passive viewing. So again, another area that's very intriguing but really complicated. Um, and so I started to mention the anterior cingulate. Uh, one of our new researchers here, Peter Bundy, I believe was the first to suggest that maybe autism involved impairments in this, this part of the brain. And I showed you before, I showed you before my findings, the control loop theory where I said I thought the anterior cingulate might detect conflict and then signal the prefrontal cortex to get ready to pay more attention. Well, these guys are writing more about this part of the anterior cingulate, which is closer to something called the amygdala and the limbic system, which is all involved in emotion. And this part of the cingulate is more involved in motor responding and the prefrontal cortex. So Peter was one of the first to think that maybe some of these deficits um, were a result of the uh, uh, poor functioning of the cingulate and some of the other brain regions associated with it. And another very hot off the press finding is that um, a group in Texas has actually now, using one of those wild social, social psychological paradigms, reported really interesting findings in the cingulate as well. In this paradigm, you have individuals who are um, they're playing a social exchange game where this person is going to give this person money, and this person's going to give this person money back. Um, and they, they start to scan this person. Right around the time when you're given the money, you know how much money you're going to get, and you're thinking about how much money you're going to give the other person. Now, these people in this experiment were always typically developing, and these people half the time had autism, and half the time had typical development. So they scan um, this person here when both sides were wondering, what kind of money am I going to get? Then this person had to decide, how much am I going to give back? And they scanned this person while they were deciding that. And what they found, and here, this is this, this little region, the cingulate, and this is the anterior part and the posterior part and that dorsal part in the middle. And what they found was that um, when you're thinking about this, 
you activate the middle part of your cingulate more strongly. Oh no, actually I'm, I'm forgetting what the, what the key is here, whether that's stronger or less strong. Um, but when you don't, when, you, when you're doing another task that has nothing to do with thinking about someone else but has really similar demands, nothing happens in your cingulate. Um, here, when you have to think the other way around, the exact opposite areas of your cingulate activate. And when you think about something that doesn't have to do with social exchange, nothing activates. Um, what they found is that when they were thinking about themselves and what they would do, because that was the instructions, you're supposed to be thinking about what you would do if you were given this money, they found that the individuals with autism did not activate the cingulate. So essentially, thinking about yourself was impaired, whereas thinking about the other person and what they would do was not impaired. So it's, it's actually a really interesting study that uses some of those kind of cool social psychology paradigms. Um, final area is gender differences in autism. And I'm just going to say that this is a hot area. There's a person named Carol Sue Carter who's thinking that um, potentially one of the reasons that we're so gender loaded for, for boys versus girls is that there's differences in some of the hormone systems that govern affiliative and social behavior. Um, some of the uh, hormones that are um, involved in uh, childbirth, in nurturing, and so forth. And her hypothesis is that maybe autism is less frequently found in girls because girls have more intact systems that have those kinds of hormones, whereas boys rely more on vasopressin, which is easier to disrupt, and if it's disrupted, causes more aggressive and less social kinds of behaviors. So we're doing a little work in that area, um, and uh, we'll have some results to tell you hopefully next year. But in sum, I think it's a great, uh, it's a time of great excitement in the field, also a time of great excitement at the Mind Institute. So many of our researchers are involved in one way or another with a lot of the programs that I mentioned. And I want to thank you for your attention, thank all the study participants, thank all my Intrepid Lab member, members, mentors, and colleagues. Thanks. If you'd like, you can take a deep breath. Okay? All right. That's, that's my gift to you. So never say you didn't get anything. Okay. Uh, thank you for being uh, very patient with us and giving us your attention and uh, one of the interesting uh, comments that I made earlier uh, when I was speaking with uh, Sally Ozanoff and Marjorie uh, before we started was that um, it would have been nice if I had access to their presentations before I wrote mine since I'm wrapping up everything but uh, it, it, it works, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it does work. So we are going to try to be uh, efficient, which is very hard uh, because uh, by nature of who I am and all of that, uh, there's no such thing. Uh, uh, and uh, I must also add that I am the son of an evangelist minister and uh, <laughs> And you know, we have to warm the audience up, so that's why I want you to breathe, you know, smile, laugh, feel good, clap your hand if you want, you know. Let's get a little juice going, okay, all right. Okay, that's enough, that's enough. Okay. Um, more seriously, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this thing called treatment. And, um, and as an intro into talking about treatment, uh, one of the comments that uh, Dr. Ozanoff made in her presentation was to acknowledge that uh, what we know about treating individuals diagnosed with uh, Asperger and high-functioning autism is based on what we learn with more classically diagnosed individuals with autism. And had it not been for that, we wouldn't know much. Uh, and uh, that is, in, in fact, uh, very important uh, because actually we are starting from that point and trying to move forward as we understand more about Asperger syndrome and high-functioning autism. 
So that, that's, that's very important to mention. In that regard, um, um, and um, I like to start off backwards. I like to get all my, my uh, admissions of faults out of the way first. And then uh, I won't have to be held to uh, uh, anything in case I lie a little bit. So uh, one of the things that I'd like to say is that whereas a lot of people present as if we know a lot about Asperger and high-functioning autism in terms of what to do and how to treat, how to work with them, we really don't. Um, what we know is that they are very capable of learning uh, and that certainly we have techniques that are very useful in facilitating learning. Um, however, one of the things we haven't figured out yet is how to help them learn how to generalize or take what they learn in one setting and use it flexibly in lots of different settings, you know? It's like walking the streets of Sacramento and then going to New York and trying to walk the streets of New York like you walk the streets of Sacramento. They don't work, you know? They, they just don't work. You need to kind of adjust them a little bit. And so that's something that uh, we, we acknowledge right away. Um, I did say I'm going to try to be efficient, so uh, I am going to do that. I am not going to go over these. I just wanted to reiterate that this is what we're talking, we're talking about as core features of autism spectrum disorders. One of the other things that it is important to recognize, and uh, Sally Ozanoff uh, noted this in her talk, that there are a lot of other symptoms that are also part of the picture with some individuals that are diagnosed as either having Asperger's syndrome or high-functioning autism. And so you might find that there is quite the existence of anxiety, ADHD, learning disabilities, sensory dysfunctions, as well as depression. And when we think about treatment, one of the things that we often do, which is not good, is to assume that everything is autism. And it's not necessarily so. And so as a psychologist, one of the things that I try to do in working with families is to say, let's take a look at what we see here. If we see a lot of behaviors suggesting anxiety, then we talk about what are some ways we might approach addressing these issues related to anxiety? In other words, um, it's important to remember that although we are referring to it all as autism, that what we're doing is really treating symptoms. And it's important not to forget those uh, as we go along, because if we forget them, we, we may be making some serious mistakes. Uh, for example, um, a lot of people assume that if you're diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, that typically what that means is you must have really good visual spatial skills. You know, really good at organizing things, puzzles and figuring out and all of those, maybe. Not all. There is a significant number of articles and books written about nonverbal learning disabilities. 
So one of the things that is important to not lose sight of is the possibility that comorbid with the symptoms of autism can be symptoms related to a diagnosis of learning disabilities. And in our rush to find out what's going on, it's important to consider that in, in that process so that you want to be talking to people who are sophisticated and trained well enough to recognize either or or both of those conditions and be able to guide you in directions in terms of how to approach or rule in or rule out conditions as you're trying to decide what an individual may need. So that's really important, very important for sure. I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, in terms of treatment programs, there is a huge debate, usually, I guess certainly in California, but I think it's everywhere. And the debate is about where does this child or individual belong? In fact, I had an interesting conversation just this evening. Can I tell about our little conversation? Yeah. See, I have to get permission because I was, <laughs> it, it, it just happened. But uh, before anybody came, not before anybody came, there were just a few people here. And I was out in the lobby waiting around. And, and I was chatting with a couple of individuals. And uh, this uh, gentleman uh, asked me, when, when were we going to have a college for uh, Asperger uh, individuals here at the Mine Institute? And uh, of course, I took it way beyond what he intended, uh, you know, I just jumped right on it. No, I didn't. Actually, I was very graceful. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we talked about that, and I just informed him that that issue, as it relates to inclusion versus uh, separation of individuals into their own settings in classrooms and schools and whatnot, is a hot topic in the field and that uh, uh, you will find many parents, certainly strong advocates for programs designed specifically for individuals on the spectrum. And you will find many professionals equally opposed to the development of programs designed specifically for individuals on the spectrum. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. Some of the reasons have to do with philosophy. Some have the philosophy that while there is no question that an individual on the spectrum has challenges, that we as a society need to learn to work with how to include all individuals in social transactions that occur in communities so that we provide more support for families because that's where individuals live and grow. Now that's a philosophical bias and there are more but I will stray away from those because we don't want to start a fight here, okay? Uh, but all of that aside, there remain questions even for school districts about the setting. Some feel strongly that um, they don't have the resources or it requires too much in the way of resources to entertain or maintain individuals in regular classrooms. Others feel that uh, they do better if they're in classrooms where they don't have to struggle so much and deal with peers. Others feel that they should be in the regular classroom 
are certainly in a setting where there are fewer people and where the program is relatively well structured. And most importantly, whether the program is an inclusion program or a separate program, the important piece that it is uh, essential not to overlook is the importance of adequate educational resources available. If your child or an individual is in a regular classroom where there are no resources, it may be better for that child to be, and this may be taken as blasphemy, but the truth is it may be better for that child to be in a special program if there are the resources available in that special program that can help the child grow and learn. And that is the issue that you must keep in front of you is that helping the child grow and learn is really uh, the most important piece. One of the other important things as a part of helping the child grow and learn is to ensure that programs present opportunities for a social interaction that promotes social relationships in relatively supervised activity. In other words, they have programs that focus on the social deficits. There is the assumption and uh, I question it myself. There is the assumption, however, that if we simply provide them with adequate social skills, that would be all they need to function well. I don't know if that's true, but it would go a long way toward helping for sure. In terms of programs, uh, there are lots of programs out there, uh, and these are a few with uh, the programs involving their conceptual models. Applied behavioral analysis is one of the um, programs that has been most beneficial in promoting and engaging in research that has demonstrated the viability of teaching and working with individuals on the spectrum. There are a number of issues involved with this particular model. Uh, I'm not going to go through all, not by any means. One of the issues has to do with uh, the generalizability of uh, what they learn. Uh, and it's an issue that every, every program has, so it's not new. The other issue is there are questions about the adequacy of the applied behavioral analysis approach, otherwise known as ABA, to foster social emotional development. And that's just one that's been out there, and there are lots of different positions about that issue. Discrete child training is simply a variant of applied behavioral analysis. There are other models out there that you see here. One of the uh, most prominent models that I did not list as an oversight, it's almost blasphemy, uh, since uh, Sally O was a, uh, not a graduate, but was part of that program for a time, uh, and that is the TEACH model. It is one of those models that really does put a lot of emphasis on visual structure and the use of visual structure and other kinds of structure as a way of facilitating learning in individuals on the spectrum. Other strategies that are quite common and used in training or teaching 
Individuals with autism spectrum disorders are social stories. And this is a model that was developed by a strategy, not a model. It's not a model. It's just a strategy that was developed by Carol Gray. And there you have comic strip conversations. You also have sensory integration treatment. And I will just say regarding that, in terms of sensory integration treatment, not everybody agrees with the idea of sensory integration treatment uh, as being effective, um, at least as having evidence to show its effectiveness. But uh, there are quite a few advocates who really uh, advocate the use of it for children who struggle with issues involving sensory overload. Uh, and in that regard, they find it quite helpful. And finally, social skills training. Uh, social skills training is an interesting, what shall I call it? I start to call it a monster, but it's, yeah, that, that, that wouldn't go good. So I need a new term. Uh, it's, it's an approach, let's call it an approach, because there are a variety of approaches that fall underneath that rubric of social skills training. Um, for example, many programs use an eclectic approach, which means they take a little from this model, a little from that model, and they put it all together and, and then they try to organize it in a structured way and involve children in a set of organized activities. You also have peer-mediated approaches. And this one is interesting because it provides quite a bit of flexibility. Peer mediation can be through a variety of means. For example, it may be that you have same age peers on the spectrum, uh, or you may have same age peers, some of whom are typically developing or maybe have different disorders, but not, are, are not on the spectrum and you combine them in a, in a way that they help each other, and particularly with the individual on the spectrum, they help that individual acquire and use social skills in a more appropriate way. Um, there are lots of variations on that, as I indicated. Uh, we also have many social skills strategies that parents are encouraged to use on their own. For example, uh, Carol McAfee and her book on navigating the social world. That is a book that parents are encouraged to start with it and use it to find things that are applicable to your child and go through a structured program of helping your child acquire the skills that are involved. In that regard, Carol Gray and her social studies do the same thing in that they all provide material that are available for parents or professionals to use in working with individuals um, or groups in trying to develop social, social skills. Uh, there is a social skills program here. It is coordinated by Dr. Beth Goodland Jones and Marjorie Solomon. And the program here is eclectic in nature with parent involvement. If you'd like more information, 
You can contact Aaron Rosenborg, Rosenborg at 7030222. And in the interest of leaving two minutes for questions, that's a joke. <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, in the interest of leaving questions, time for questions, uh, I'm, I'm just going to stop at this point, and you're welcome to ask questions of anyone. We do have a hand mic somewhere. There it is. And uh, Andrea will find you if you will raise your hand. And uh, Sally and Marjorie will come up and join me if need be. Thank you. Um, I'm an adult, actually 50 years old, who has Asperger's syndrome. And I have a question and a comment. Um, first of all, the comment is regarding um, Dr. Solomon's presentation. What I got from what you were saying, Dr. Solomon, with a lot of your studies is it's difficult for people with autism spectrum disorders to change course in the middle of the stream, like with the buttons have to switch to press a red button versus a green button, and then also to carry information learned in one setting to another setting. I can testify personally, that's why we hate change. <laughs> Anyhow, the question I had for all of you is, I'm 50 years old, and I'm curious what comments you have on how Asperger's syndromes things change over the lifespan. Like, for example, my circumscribed interests and social issues seem to be less. My sensory issues seem to be bigger for me. I get totally wiped out by too much stimuli. So can those things kind of vary and, and come and go over the lifespan? Uh, I guess I've lived the longest <laughs> of the three of us. So. By default, it comes to me. Um, no, seriously speaking, my uh, experience, and I, I have to acknowledge, I'm a clinician, not a researcher. I actually work in the trenches trying to figure out how to work with a child, how to help and move things forward. And my anecdotal observation is that they can come and go. Um, what I have seen with adolescents and young adults in particular um, is that they have been able to modify those things as they have matured and learned different strategies for managing them. Uh, and. So I, I guess it depends on the circumstances, and uh, and I, I've seen examples of that. Yes. I agree too. Although I think that um, actually there's really a great need to continue to study people over the lifespan, and that's that's certainly something that's captured the attention of National Institutes of Health as well so hopefully there'll be more studies because we don't know a lot as you can tell from my presentation my goodness there's so much we don't know and your question is something we really haven't studied empirically so well we've studied a little bit but not a lot hi I'd like to follow up on the older Asperger's uh, patient because I'm a speech pathologist by trade, and I've treated the young children, and I know the focus is on young children, but since I've become conversant with signs and symptoms and things of that sort, I'm running into Asperger's adults everywhere. <laughs> and they're kind of lost. No, the, the, the groups, uh, they have psychologists that they go to, they have psychiatrists that they go to. They don't know anything about Asperger's or high-functioning autism. Is the Mind Institute going to start some kind of a group where these people can gather? In fact, there is one. Um, and there's been one 
for about five years, I think. So it meets, um, it's a social support group, um, right? Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Um, it's a social support group, it meets monthly, I believe, Tuesdays, the second Tuesday of the month, I believe, is that right? Um, and I don't know the exact age range, but I think it's for sort of late adolescence, and there are people in it who I've referred myself in their 50s and older. So it's a very wide range of folks. So yeah. in fact, I think that when it started, we it was mostly adolescents, and yes. because my friend has gone mm -hmm. and, and found no common ground. Yes, right. I agree. Um, I've been to it. Right, so that it's more young adults than, than older adults. And the people I'm meeting um, are, like me, we're old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. We'll try to get some people in the back, because we're going to take two more questions. So. Surprise me. <laughs> oh. I had a question for Dr. Ozanoff, probably, especially you were talking about there being little distinction between the high-functioning autism and Asperger's and kind of alluded to regional centers in some areas not qualifying people for services who have Asperger's. And mm -hmm. I, I'm just starting this journey with my son who's seven and I'm under the impression that we are in one of these regions. And I'm wondering, um, as a parent, I even find high-functioning autism somewhat of a misnomer because the deficits affect every part of the child's life. So yes, high-functioning compared to a nonverbal person, but doesn't feel high-functioning mm -hmm. when you think about this person interacting in their, in their life and in their world. So I'm wondering, as a parent, wh what can we do to try to advocate for regional services for children that are in this high-functioning slash Asperger category? Very good questions you brought up. So, I mean, there are a variety of things I'd like to say related to that. First of all, I think that there's a lot of political pressure at the national and international level because of some of the issues you're raising, that there would be a categorical distinction between children who get no services and children who do based on what are apparently minuscule differences in the um, presentation of the child. So those are really trying to be addressed. That's, in fact, what that body of research Research that I summarized really was all about, in fact. Um, it wasn't just sort of abstract, you know, this would be interesting to study, but really does this make a difference? And I think that, you know, there's nails going in the coffin as we speak, and people are actively trying to um, figure that out for the next version of the DSM. So while it may or may not help you in the very short run of getting a diagnosis right now with your son, really researchers are very invested in changing that. Um, and in fact, also clinicians and researchers here at the Mind have tried to influence the regional centers. Um, we, I personally, and I know others have as well, have gone to you know like case manager monthly meetings to talk about these issues and to talk about how individuals, just because they're called high functioning, really it's only relative to children with full classic autism, but compared to a typically developing child, have lots of treatment you know needs that are not being met if the child is you know, we're excluded from services. So we are, we're doing our best. It always is the case that it takes a long time for research to sort of trickle into practice and that there's particular kinds of research that need to be done to take things from laboratories or from the Mind Institute and get them out into the community and to become in clinical practice, but we're working on it. So anyway, that's... Not a panacea for you and your son right now. I guess the, the other thing that I would say is being cognizant of these differences, um, you know, be careful how you report things and that kind of stuff. Because if you emphasize too much sometimes the higher functioning aspects or what the child can do, it is going to, you know, come off in those checklists and you know, be one less symptom and then boom, it's Asperger's and you're not served. So parents often feel, and, and I know this myself as a parent, feel um, like they want to walk a careful balance between really um, saying what their child can do and being proud of their child and some of the challenges that they've overcome already and things like that, and in some ways emphasize the positive. Um, but you know, you, you just need to be careful about really telling the professionals who are interviewing you what your child can do independently, without assistance, all on their own, and that kind of thing, so that the needs for intervention are really clear. Okay, should we take a final question? 
my question relates to hers. I'm working with two siblings, uh, six-year-old high-functioning autism, seven-year-old Asperger, and we were just told by the regional center we can't receive services for the Asperger child even though the sibling is receiving them. Is there anything you could suggest we do, any place else we can search for services? I mean, one, the first thing to say is that I think they, they, people should take a careful look at the diagnosis and make sure it's right. So that's one thing. Um, because Asperger syndrome is, I think, right now a sort of diagnosis du jour and that people are using it widely because I think it feels sort of better to professionals sometimes to give because it's not as severe a diagnosis, it's not as alarming for parents, et cetera. And so in my experience and in the experience of research studies, about 80% of kids with Asperger syndrome actually meet criteria for autism when it's done carefully. So I'm not an advocate for shopping for diagnoses and I'm very much an advocate for playing by the rules and applying the DSM criteria, but one thing I would say is that many children who clinically seem like they have Asperger's syndrome will actually meet the autism criteria. So that would be one suggestion, is that they see an expert and figure that out. They diagnose them at all, both boys. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can get an outside expert rather than in, internal in the system. Okay, so I think, shall we wrap up then? Yes. Thank you very much everybody for staying. The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.